Betty's husband died in year 11. She has not remarried and has maintained a home for herself and her dependent daughter, whom she can claim. In the summer of year 13, the daughter was killed in an accident. What was Betty's most advantageous filing status for year 13? Well, let's just say the daughter didn't die in an accident. What would the answer have been? Would have been qualifying widow because when a spouse dies in year 11, you can file jointly for year 11 and then qualifying widow for years 12 and 13. The fact that the daughter was killed in an accident in year 13, that dependent's death during year 13 will not preclude Betty from filing as a qualifying widow in year 13 because filing status is determined on the date of death in the case of death. So on the date of death in year 13, there was still a qualifying widow situation there. Now, if the question asked about year 14, Betty would likely file single. So year 11, she'd still be married filing jointly one last time. Years 12 and 13, qualifying widow. Year 14, single, because the dependent child died in year 13. If dependent child didn't die in year 13, then in year 14, Betty would likely file as head of household. And we're always trying to anticipate the next question. And that would be the next question. What if there was no death of a dependent and they asked about year 14, then you'd say head of household. Anticipating the next question, I call that the I-75 difference. You always wanna be doing that because that's a big advantage for you on these exams. Dan and Danielle Mitchell are a childless married couple with no other dependents who lived apart for all of the current year. On December 31st of the current year, they were legally separated under a decree of separate maintenance. That means they're no longer married. Based on the facts, which of the following is the only choice available to them for the current year? Well, since they're unmarried, then married filing separately would not be an option. And of course, married filing jointly wouldn't either. If they're childless and have no other dependents, single would be the only option available to them. They would each have to file their own return and claim a single status. Remember that filing status is determined on the last day of the tax year, even though they were married the entire year. Because they were divorced on December 31st, they're considered unmarried for the entire tax year. Tom and Sally are divorced and both looking to claim daughter Lisa as a dependent. Sally had custody of Lisa for more than 50% of the tax year. Is that important? Maybe. But Tom earned considerably more income than Sally. Is that important? We'll see. Tom claimed Lisa the previous two tax years. Which of the following is correct? So the parent having custody for more than 50% of the year, that's the parent that's entitled to claim the dependent. But the dependent may be claimed by the non-custodial parent if there's an agreement signed by both parents and attached to the non-custodial parent's return. Tom having claimed Lisa the previous two tax years and earning considerably more income than Sally, that's not relevant. So Sally's the winner here because she has custody of Lisa for more than 50% of the tax year, so letter B is the correct answer. Henry's 41 years old, divorced from wife Helen since April of the tax year. They have two minor children. One child lives with Henry, the other with Ellen. The children have been with their respective parents from April through December of the tax year. Henry provides all the support for the minor child living with him, the filing status with the lowest rate that Henry qualifies for is what? And it would be head of household. Filing status is determined on December 31st. And as of that day, Henry was not married, so he can't file jointly or even separately. So it would be between single and head of household. He could file single, but that would not be beneficial for tax purposes and the questions leaning toward the one with the lowest rate. In determining if a taxpayer qualifies for head of household filing status, the taxpayer is considered unmarried if all the following requirements are met. Taxpayer paid more than half of the cost of keeping up the home for the tax year. And you can check that one off because it says that Henry provides all the support for the minor children living with him. Then the taxpayer spouse did not live in the home during the last six months of the tax year. You can check that off because they've been living apart since April. And that leans towards something called the abandoned spouse rule for people who are still legally married, but if a spouse moves out and doesn't live with them for the last six months of the year, even though they're still legally married, they can get away with filing head of household. And then the home was for more than half the year, the main home of the taxpayer's child, stepchild or adopted child. 
whom the taxpayer or the non-custodial parent can properly claim as a dependent. Henry qualifies for head of household. So the answer is B. For the current year, Eli is unmarried and paid more than half the cost of keeping up his home. Which of the following dependents would qualify Eli to file as head of household? A. Eli's grandson Edward, who was away from Eli's home for eight months while attending boarding school. Yes, that would qualify. Eli's grandson, who was away from Eli's home for eight months while attending boarding school, is considered temporary and does not apply to the six months at home test that he would have to meet in order to qualify as a dependent for head of household purposes. Even though away at school, Edward still considered to be at home in Eli's house during the tax year. Let's go on to B. Eli's mother Edna, who Eli could claim as a dependent and whose main home for the current year was a home for the elderly, for which Eli paid more than one half the cost. And that would qualify. Edna would qualify also. Because a taxpayer can maintain a separate home for a parent, such as a nursing home, and still qualify to file as head of household. The key here is that Eli paid more than half the cost, so it's as if Edna is still living with Eli. So to qualify as head of household, the government doesn't force the elderly to live with you in order for them to qualify as your dependent for purposes of filing head of household. To satisfy the requirements for head of household filing status, a preparer must do which of the following? There's actually quite a bit you have to do now before you just file as head of household for your client. You've got to complete form 8867. You've got to do a paid preparer's due diligence checklist and retain the records described in the due diligence checklist section of form 8867. You don't have to see a copy of the birth certificate or social security card for each child of the client who's under 17, but you do have to complete form 8867, paid preparer's due diligence checklist, and you have to retain the records described in that due diligence checklist. And these rules to satisfy the requirements for head of household filing status are very similar to the rules to satisfy the earned income credit requirements.